Well, good morning. You get me for Sunday school this morning. Or good, bad, or ugly, right? So, good to see you this morning. We'll go ahead and get started. If folks will show up, then good. If not, then glad you're here, too. Let's turn to 435. You don't have to stand up, but we'll sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. 435, all three verses. What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, a peace we often forfeit. Oh, a needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We be discouraged to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise for sin? in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Okay, let's pray together. Matthew, you want to pray? Thank you. What, you haven't prayed for like three months? Oh, okay. Not in public. Well, that's why I meant. I didn't mean in private. I hope you prayed in private three months. Anyway. Okay, any prayer requests for today? Sarah? Hmm? Yeah, thank you. Please pray for my wife that she'll feel better. We don't know what she has, but it's hanging on there, so... I'll just pray that she feels better. She's upstairs resting, probably watching a Hallmark movie right now. So now watch, she'll message on the thing and say, no, I'm watching you. But anyway. Anyone else say prayer requests? Anything that's come up? Okay. I'll do please pray for my wife. We appreciate that. Please pray for my mother with her neck as it's still hurting and things like that. And pray for school as it goes on this week that everything will get done. So. All right. Are we all awake this morning? Kind of, sort of, maybe? Yes, Phoebe? No. That way you know when it goes off. It's not going to distract me up there. It'll keep you from playing games on it, too. I'm just joking. Okay. Where are you reading in your Bible, Jimmy? Matthew and Genesis. Matthew and Genesis. Psalms. Matthew, what? Matthew and Genesis Psalms. Matthew and Psalms. Matthew and Psalms. Okay. 
you have anything that God spoke to you about this week in relation to Genesis and Psalms or Matthew? <laughs> You didn't know I was going to do this, did you? I can come back to you. Andrea, you got anything? You're in a Mark and Exodus. So Jimmy, Matthew, and Genesis, you're in Mark and Exodus. Be optimistic but not ignorant of the truth. Where's that from? Excess six, but that's what you got. Yeah, it's good to be optimistic, and we can't be delusional about how things really are. We should want the truth at all times, right? Good. Matthew, what about you? Proverbs, Acts, and Psalms right now. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. You can still glean a lot from that historical stuff. <laughs> Anything interesting God spoke to you about? Stephen? Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. What about Stephen? Uh, what what yeah. resounded with you about him? Yeah, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Holy Spirit. Well, that's true. Man greatly used by God and quickly persecuted, right? Oh, good. Jimmy? I was reading Matthew Ma and Psalms. Matthew and Psalms, yes. And that's how it's from Matthew. Okay. God, I need to listen to what people tell me and not just go my own way. Yeah, listen to what people tell you and don't go your own way. That's good advice. Yeah. Anything else? Oh, good. Listen to what people tell you as long as it's not illegal, immoral, unbiblical, right? Yeah, don't just go walking off cliffs and, yeah. Well, good. Elizabeth, you have anything? Uh-huh. And basically a lot of it was the area of, like, the and people And what's a scorner? They're a person that rejects God's word and goes out of their way to recruit you to their evil cause. Yes. Anything else? Okay. Sarah, what about you? I was reading Matthew 20. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Reassuring if you trust in God and his word, scary if you don't, right? Yeah. Yep. I, I've been in both places too before, but nothing to be scared about because he'll take perfect care of you. That's a good thing to learn. That's a good thing. Teresa, you got anything from your Bible reading? Not today. Okay. Phoebe, did I call on you? No. Oh, it's because you're all the way back there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I know exactly where you're talking about, too. Yeah. That we, we can comfort others because of what God has done for us. Is that it? Yeah, that's, I forget what chapter that is, but I know it's in, oh, it's chapter one? Okay, 
Well, that's good. Well, good. Well, the challenge for everyone, here's the challenge. And I'll make sure my wife follows up on this, and she'll gladly do so if, if um, she's well, which I would hope she is next week. I want everyone to read Luke chapter 11 and be able to have something. I don't care if it's the same thing, but have something specific that you can pull from that about prayer, about God, uh, whatever God speaks to you about, and a personal application for it. So Luke chapter 11 is your assignment. I know we don't normally get that, but it'll get, get some folks out of a rut, and getting out of a rut's a good thing for us. I've been reading through the book of Acts, haven't read through that this year yet, and I read about Paul's whole dilemma that he got himself into in Jerusalem towards the end of the book, and the fact that those guys, if you read those chapters, they were really good at playing politics. And uh, Felix, I believe it was, I'm not in the chapter right here, but Felix or Festus, no, it's Festus. Uh, Felix was the governor before Festus. Festus took over for Felix as the Roman governor of Judea. And they let Paul be prisoner for years, not for a short time, but for years, for one reason. They were playing politics. <laughs> they wanted to keep the Jews satisfied. Paul done nothing to warrant being a prisoner. He'd not broken any law. And these Roman officials knew that, and they just wanted to show the Jews a pleasure, as the Bible says. And my challenge was, people play politics, don't do it. <laughs> so we need to be biblical and not worry about the politics of our day. We need to stick by the scriptures. So, anyone else have anything else to share? No? Okay. Well, do turn to Luke chapter 11, if you would, and we're going to go through our little study through this, just a refresher course on prayer, and we'll see if my wife can't be back with us next week. But I started this a few weeks ago when we had folks visiting with us. We'll just continue through it till we finish it. It's probably a three-part lesson. But we do live in a day, people don't know how to pray, people don't pray. People don't pray because they either don't know how to pray, or they don't have that thriving walk with Christ. They don't want to live the faith life, they don't believe God can hear and answer prayer. But the fact of the matter is this, our God is real, He loves us, He wants us to pray to Him, He wants us to have that relationship with Him and His Word, and He will answer our prayers as we, as His children, pray to Him and rely upon him, submitting to his will. It's so important. And the more that God answers prayer, the more we will pray. That's generally how, well, you can, I don't know if you could call it this, but it seems like you can call it the faith cycle or what have you. Whereas you trust in the Lord, he comes through for you, he proves his word to be true, and thus it encourages us to keep praying. The opposite can also be true. You have that what's called the faithless cycle or the insanity cycle in the book of Judges where everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. They just did what they wanted to. And that's not what we're given to do as believers. We're given to obey God's word, not just do what we want. But they did that in the book of Judges and they would fall into idolatry and sin for a certain time. God would get sick of it and send oppressors um, their way until they got sick of it and finally called out to God in their anguish and then God would answer and they get right with God for a time and then they fall back into sin called the insanity cycle. So we can have one or the other. One is flesh, the other is faith and certainly God wants us to live by faith. So let's read Luke chapter 11 if you would and then we'll pray the Bible says, And it came to pass that as he, being Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, 
as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive every one that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and go to him unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth. He that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh it shall be open. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Our Father, we thank you that we can pray. And we just pray you would help us today as we humble ourselves before you and your word. We take time during this hour to study about prayer. We pray that you would help us to be a people of prayer. That we would give you the glory, the attention, the worship that you so richly deserve. We pray that you would guide us now and feed us as we need. Fill us with your spirit, we pray. Please help my wife as she's sick. Help her to feel better, we ask. Help Heather. She's got a migraine today. We pray you take that away even before church at the 11 o'clock hour so she can maybe come. We pray you be with any others that are under the weather that we do not know about, that you'd help them. We ask you be with my mother with her neck, that you'd encourage her. And we thank you. Please be with Brother Heppen with his back that it would get healed. Father, we ask you to be with the Matthews and the Jennies as they're going through various things as missionaries and just pray you'd encourage these people. Thank you for hearing and answering our prayers. We do pray these things, surrendering them to your will and in Jesus' name, amen. So if you remember the first part, the first part is we pray according to God's pattern to prayer. Jesus is praying, and the disciples have seen him pray. They've seen God answer his prayers. If you remember, they are in a faithless day, much like ours. Our day is all oh, God's dead. He doesn't care. He's just some weak, feeble old man. Men just wrote the Bible, and you can't trust in that old book. You can't trust in our God. He, just on and on people go, and none of that's true. Our God's as alive as he was thousands of years ago. Tens of thousands of years ago. He's as alive and vibrant and strong. He changes not. And there will never be a time when he is not. And so, we understand that he does answer prayer. He does hear us. He does love us. And Jesus is showing the disciples that as he's praying, and it fostered such a, such a desire in them, which it ought to in all of us, to pray, that they finally come to him and say, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Christ, also being the example of the great teacher, taught them, instead of Keeping God to himself, he taught them how to pray and gave them this pattern, which is called the Lord's Prayer. When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, we understand as God's children, God is our Father. 
He is not the man upstairs. He's not Santa Claus. He is our Father. He is God. He birthed us into his family. And that is a wonderful truth of the scriptures. We're born again into the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ, right? Our Father which art in heaven, he abides in heaven. The earth is his footstool. He is immense and thus he is everywhere. But he is spirit. He is spirit. We cannot see him that we know he exists. We see the evidence of his existence. The things that we cannot explain. People say, well, man just evolved. Well, you can't evolve a conscience. You can't evolve that which is spiritual. God gave us a conscience. We have creation. Man says, well, creation just evolved. Think about it. It's impossible for evolution to be true. Because if you miss one link in that whole chain, it just all falls apart. It's impossible. God created all things. There's clear evidence of intelligent design in the universe. It's not hard to see. We just have to be willing to see it and accept it. Not many people are because if we reject evolution, then we have to acknowledge that there is a creator. If there is a creator, then that must mean we are his creation. And as his creation, we are subject to the creator. And people don't like that. People don't like authority, do they? I mean, just look at the world. But it doesn't change the truth. It's our Father which is in heaven. It says, hallowed be thy name. God is holy. God tells us, be ye holy as I am holy. How do we know how to be holy? God's word tells us how to be holy. By the way, we cannot be holy unless we are saved. Thy kingdom come. We desire God's presence. Right? We want Christ to come and take us out of this old world because it has nothing good for us. We also want Christ to come and set up his literal kingdom on earth, which he will one day. And we ought to desire such. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. As in heaven, so on earth. We ought to desire God's will to be done above all things. Because it's going to be done. God's will will be done. How much better for us to go along with God's will instead of kicking and screaming, rejecting it, right? Thy will be done. There's nothing that God is out of control of, right? God is either permissive of, allowant of, or the direct cause of. That's what the Bible shows us clearly. Thy will be done as in heaven, so in earth. Give us day by day our daily bread. We pray for per, uh, provision for our bodies and for our spirits. God would teach us from his word. It's so important that we read our Bibles every day, that we glean from God's word. We get personal application from it. We need it. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? Because Jesus says we will be filled if we do so. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that's indebted to us. We ought to forgive. We ought to work to be reconciled if that's possible. But we can forgive. Forgiveness is mercy, right? As we see it in Scripture, it's not necessarily reconciliation because reconciliation requires two parties. Forgiveness just requires one. You and me, <laughs> us saying, I'm not going to hold this over this person. I'm not going to hold a grudge. I'm not going to be bitter. Doesn't mean I'm going to be that person's best friends. If they're an abusive person, we shouldn't be around them if we can help it, right? But it means that we're not going to seek revenge. It means we're going to have mercy and let God be the righteous judge. Reconciliation's good. It's great if we can do it. We ought to seek that. But if the other person won't be reconciled, there's nothing we can do about that, right? So we ought to forgive because Jesus says if we don't forgive, then we're not being like him because he forgave us and he won't forgive our sins. 
lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Right? We're asking to not be led into temptation. We're asking to be delivered from the works of the devil. There's a lot in that pattern for prayer. How should we pray? How should we pray? Well, you have some of the how there in that pattern. The, more the attitude of prayer. You have some of the attitude, too, in the pattern. The attitude is one of kinship and relationship, right? Not estrangement, not God, I don't really know you. That might be at the beginning when we're new Christians, new believers. Closer we get to God, we understand who he is and our relationship with him. Attitude of surrender. You have the attitude of teachability and surrender ultimately boiled down to humility before God. That goes a long, long way with him. Long way. Not just God, but people too. Because if we're humble before him, he can do anything with us. Anything. But if we just think we know better than God and we're prideful before him, well, we know what the Bible says about pride. God resists the proud, right? But gives grace to the humble. Attitude of humility. Attitude of forgiveness, right? But as far as praying, be, you know, how often should I pray this? Some people say, well, I should only pray it once and let it go because God doesn't want me to bother him. That's verse number five through eight that tells us that the attitude is not so or not to be so. People, again, have different views on God. And our view of God needs to be shaped from the scripture, not from our own minds. I mean, I, I know people that will not pray for themselves. They will not pray for themselves. They feel like it's selfish to pray for themselves when the Bible says otherwise. We should definitely pray for ourselves. We need all the help we can get. We should pray for other people. We should pray for anything, and we can literally pray for anything as long as it's surrendered to God's will, right? Which of you shall have a friend, Jesus puts forth by way of illustration? This is not a parable. A parable is a heavenly tale or spiritual tale with an earthly meaning. Every part of a parable means something. This is just an illustration Jesus puts forth, verse 5 through 8. He says, Which of you shall have a friend and shall go to him at midnight and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And we have a great right to go into the throne room of grace, Hebrews 4 says. We can go boldly before the king. We're his children, right? But how ought we to petition the king for our needs? God says, often, often. You have a burden on your heart, you have a need that you want to see God take care of, feel free to pray to him as often as you want, as often as you like. With an attitude of importunity, verse 8 says, unashamed persistence. People say, well, God will get upset with me. He'll get irritated. He'll be bothered. No, no. He's telling us to bother him. He's telling us to pray and pray often. So with us being flesh, we might get irritated if Phoebe, Jimmy, and Andrea or someone comes and calls and calls and calls or texts and texts and texts or, or comes and knocks on a door or whatever until something gets done. It must be important to that person, but we might get irritated 
But God never does. Because he doesn't see it as, oh, this person's bothering me again. I'll get to it when I get to it. Leave me alone. That's not his attitude. His attitude, his attitude is, I see that's important to you. His attitude is, because it's important to you, it especially will get an answer. I mean, can you imagine if Jimmy comes and says, Daddy, it's lunchtime, and I need food, and I can't make food for myself because I'm just inept for some reason. We know that's not true. but And I get to busy, being busy on a project, and I forget. Well, if hu hunger is enough, and if he's starving to death, which teenagers tend to make you think, and we know that's not reality, but... If it's the truth, he's going to come and remind me until I get him food. Or if he's hurt himself, I'm going to take care of that right away. But if he's hurt himself and I forget, then he's going to come remind me, Daddy, I'm bleeding all over the floor or whatever. If he has a need or any of the kids have a need, they're going to remind that it's a need, a real need. And God says, treat me that way. Treat me that way. Because when we pray, it's usually not time for God to answer that prayer immediately. God does have a timetable for it. He also, you imagine, wants, us to, uh, wants to know that it's important to us instead of praying something once and then leaving it alone. And so he says, bother me, just like this man. You see, this man had a friend. He went at midnight. Man visited him. You say, well, that's kind of rude. Well, that story. Culture dictated that the friend of this man needed to put out food to be a good host, a gracious host to this man. If he did not do that, he would be an ungracious host. That's Eastern culture. Western culture is uh, just get whatever's in the fridge. Eastern culture is very, um, you know, kind in that manner. And so he knew where the bread was. It was with his friend. See, God wants to be our first avenue, not our last. He wants to be the one we turn to first. That's not to say never go to the doctor, never go to the bank, never do X, Y, Z. It's to say, go to God first, and he'll tell us what we should do. This man knew where the bread was. He couldn't go to the store. He had to go to his friend. God has everything we ever need at his disposal. He can meet every need that we ever have. If we will trust him. And folks today don't want to. They don't want to. But he went to his friend and he says, A friend of mine in his journey has come to me. This We would consider this to be a small thing, right? I mean, three loaves of bread. The man's not dying for, for hunger. He's not in pursuit, being pursued by thieves or anything. It's a small need. God cares about the little things. Say, I have a headache. Well, pray about that. Maybe God will take it away. Maybe he, <laughs> you know, take some Tylenol too while you're at it, right? But maybe he'll take it away all the quicker. I've got to take a trip. Well, put your seatbelt on, but also pray that God will help you not to get in a wreck, right? Little things that we perceive to be little. God cares about those. He wants to be involved in our lives. He doesn't want to be the, one, the, the weird uncle that we reach out to when we need money that we never talk to otherwise. That's not a good relationship with anyone, is it? He wants to be right there with us. He wants to be our first point of contact. He wants us to talk to him often, to learn about him daily, right? Be right in the center of our lives, 
right at the apex of our lives, not being estranged from us. So the small need, God cares about the big needs too, by the way. All things are possible with God. Don't dare think that God can't because he can. Don't dare think that he can't because he can. He can do all things. And he cares. A friend of mine in his journeys come to me, it says, I have nothing to set before him. He from within shall answer, trouble me not. The doors now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give, me. Could, give thee. Could this man have gotten the bread? Yes. Could he unlock the door and get out of bed and possibly not even bother his children? Yes. He was just being lazy. He didn't want to get up. It wasn't I cannot, it's I will not. And there's times God says, it's not time yet. It's not time yet. But he says that I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And you know this well by now. But the man would not stop knocking. He would not stop reminding his friend. He would not leave the door alone. He risked the very wrath of his friend, maybe even to the degree of losing his friendship by beating on the door, waking the kids up, waking the wife up, making the man get out of bed, unlock the door and give him the bread. It was important to him. If something's important to us, we'll keep praying. I'm guilty as anyone else. We forget about things. That's why it's important to write things down. But folks, we need to pray. Do you have someone on your heart that needs to be saved? Keep praying. It may be that God will save them. Do you have someone on your heart that's away from the Lord? Keep praying. It may be that God will bring them back. Do you have temptations and trials like we sang, what a friend we have in Jesus? Keep praying. God will help us through those. Do you have pay and jobs to get, cars to drive and clothes to wear, and you know how life is. Health to keep well and all that good stuff. Keep praying. Keep praying. God will make sure we have exactly what we need according to his timetable. He wants us to bother him. He wants us to bother him. I don't like being bothered sometimes. Todd, you like being bothered sometimes? Yeah. God wants us to bother him all the time. Anytime. Because he loves us. He's always got time for us. You see, parents aren't spiritual beings that can give their children equal amounts of time or spend time with them all the time at the same time. But God can do that because he is a spiritual being. His spirit lives within us. He's got time for us. If we have time for him. We have to get past this whole worldly idea. God doesn't care. No, he does care. We have to get past the idea of God's not able. No, he is able. God doesn't love me. Oh, no, he does. He does. It's like Sarah was saying earlier. You know, God's got our lives all planned for us. He knows exactly what decisions we'll make. He created us from our very genes and cells and all that good stuff. He, he knows exactly how we're made up. He knows exactly what our lives are going to be. And when I was a young person, that was a scary thing. But you know why that was scary? I wasn't close to God. I'm not saying anyone is or isn't. But I'll tell you, for me, the reason I was scared is when I was a teenager, I didn't have that relationship with Christ. I didn't have it. I was one of those guys that was 
oh, if I surrender to God's will, then God's going to call me to China, and I don't want to go to China. And I'm scared to death that God's going to do this. It's, it's just ridiculous thinking, I know. It's ridiculous thinking. I've found since then that God calls us to do what he'll give us a love to do. Right, Matthew? <laughs> I found that out with engineering, didn't you? God calls us to do what we have a love to do, what he gives us a love to do. That's what we, uh, we have the verse upstairs, and I've not yet memorized all of it, but we delight ourselves. The, the gist of it is we delight ourselves in the Lord. He will give us the desires of our heart. That's not to say he'll make us rich and powerful. That's to say we surrender ourselves to God and his will. He'll give us a love for what he wants us to love. And that's the same for anything. I don't understand that, but it's true. The verse is true. But we have to keep praying. We have to trust him. And we might get scared. We might be afraid because we've never done things before. There's times as 38 years old, I'm still scared to do things. <laughs> but we have to go forward by faith. And as God proves himself, he takes the fear away as we move forward, as we learn new things, as we continue on. I tell you the truth. I'm a lot less scared about building a bathroom than I was months ago <laughs> because nothing's exploded in there yet. And you know, God proves himself. God proves himself. We should finish there because the next part's going to take another half hour. So are you praying on something? What is it that burdens your heart? Whatever it is, write it down so you don't forget about it. And keep praying about it. Don't think God doesn't hear because he does. Don't think God isn't working because he is. That's one of the things of faith and prayer. We can't see many times, oftentimes even, what God's doing behind the scenes. It's much like sowing the seed of the gospel, handing out a trick. Um, giving the gospel to someone online, giving a John and Romans, and you say, well, I don't know if that person ever got saved. And we might not. It's just faith. We sow by faith. We pray by faith. We walk by faith, trusting that God is keeping his promises and that his word is true. Just keep praying. Keep praying. God is working. And we see an answer to prayer, if not today, then one day, because he promises to answer. Father, pray that you take these things, that you'd encourage us and help us. We pray that you would give us a blessed rest of the day. We thank you for this hour. We thank you for the good things that we heard from folks Bible reading. And we pray that you would encourage us through it and help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So I should ask Todd, where are you reading? Where am I reading? In your Bible. In Matthew. Matthew? Are you reading in Matthew too? Let's see if you get what Jimmy got. You just finished. You get anything in? Um, basically, in, and I'm almost finished too, with 27. Uh-huh. Right. And they just can't do it because they don't realize he is God. He knows what they're, what they're, what they're thinking. Uh -huh. They're trying to entrap them. And it's just, I don't know. That, for some reason, that's very encouraging to me. To see. That he knows. Yeah, that he's just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's almost comical in the back that they're trying to, to uh, entrap. That they, there's. Right, <laughs> that there's nothing that they can say because he did nothing wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah, very much. <laughs> well, good. That's great. Well, just remember, 
please, Luke chapter 11, it's one chapter, one chapter, just read through that, and we'll especially go and go through that line by line next week, see what you got out of it, so it'll be an encouragement to you to read, read on your own, but hope you'll read that, and we'll start service here in 15 minutes or less, so, all right, God bless you.